Hello everyone and welcome to the channel for another Dwarf 2 video. Now, this is the official Dwarf 2 review video that I have been working on for quite a while now. Um, uh, most of my opinion of the Dwarf 2 is going to be stated uh, throughout the video. Um, the final verdict of my opinion of Dwarf 2 will be stated at the end of the video. Um, we're going to be going over the basics of the astrophotography process with the Dwarf 2 uh, in regards to the astro mode, kind of going over some of the new features of the app. Uh, the connectability, how to transfer stuff from your Dwarf 2 to your laptop. Um, this is a very basic beginner's kind of guide. We're not really diving into the super deep stuff, but definitely going over the basics so that once you get your Dwarf 2, uh, you'll be ready to go uh, if your main focus is going to be astrophotography. Also, at the end of the video, we're going to be running through a Pics and Sight uh, run through a very beginner basic you don't have to worry about not being able to follow it very well because it's extremely easy stuff that we're going to go over um i know pigs insight has sometimes been very daunting to some people but i hope that this video is going to help that uh kind of go away and make it a little bit easier but i'm uh, very excited to get started with the dwarf 2 uh, excited to take it outside and give it a run this tonight we're going to be working on the orion nebula so let's take it outside and get to work all right, so this is where the fun now begins. As you can see, I do have my Dwarf 2 on its tripod here again. Ring light is back on and we are ready for some deep sky astrophotography. Um, first things first though, obviously, what I always prefer to do is polar alignment. Of course, you don't have to do polar alignment in order for the Dwarf 2 to work properly, but it's definitely something I would recommend if you plan on leaving your Dwarf 2 out for an extended period of time. I've had a hard time saying that for some reason. but. The reason for that is because the longer you have your door 2 out here, if it's not an equatorial mode, it's going to end up uh, having a lot of field rotation. You're going to end up having to crop out a lot of your door 2 image, uh, especially on these wider field of view objects that we are going to be targeting, such as the Orion Nebula, uh, which is what we happen to be targeting tonight. And as I can see, as I'm sure you noticed, I have a hat on because I realized after watching that last part of the video, my hair was kind of insane. So anyways. Uh, Polaris is that way, so in order to polar align it, it's a pretty simple process, especially if you have this kind of tripod again, link in the description. You just find Polaris by holding it, lowering your Dwarf 2 down, making sure this side of the Dwarf 2 is aligned with Polaris, at least roughly. It doesn't ever have to be exact. And once it's there, you should be good to go. So I think I should be okay having it just like this. Um, of course, sometimes it might take a little bit longer for you to find it. Uh, some people are more perfectionist about it. They have these little scopes that they sell on eBay, but just doing it roughly should be okay. Now, the next part you have to do is open your Dwarf 2 up like so. So what we're gonna do first is actually go to the function. We're gonna hit the calibration and hit confirm. Now, the great thing about the new Dwarf 2 update is the fact that it doesn't use as much of the sky to have to calibrate. Uh, for, I'm pretty sure, it required about 15 degrees. Uh, maybe it's just 5 degrees now to actually figure out where it is in the night sky, what angle it's at. Um, just with that 5 degrees now, it works so much better. Uh, you don't really have to worry so much about uh, if objects are going to get in the way because it doesn't require as much of the sky to do that calibration. So let's allow it to do the calibration. It should only take a minute. As you can see, it did happen to get some of the move right there. So that's a bit of an accident, uh, but it should still work fine either way. So let's allow that to finish and we will move on from that step. All right, as you can see, calibration is a success. So what we have to do now is go to our astro, sorry, not astro, we go to our function and we go to our star target. Now, the great thing about this update it has, is that it has this huge catalog of options that you can scroll through. Some have pictures, some don't. Um, if you don't know what some of these things are, you can just look it up on Google. Um, but it has about 500 objects now, which is so much better in comparison to the very few that I have in the beginning. But what we're gonna do tonight is we are going to image the Orion Nebula. So let's go ahead and find that. It should be here somewhere. I would think it would be more obvious, but I guess it's not. Let's go to Nebula, and it should be here. Let's find it. There it is, M42. Found it, you click on it, you hit confirm, and that's all you have to do. No more coordinates, nothing like that. It should automatically go to the image. Now, as you can see, it is somewhat behind a branch, so we might have to wait just a little bit for that to finish. Um, but in the meantime, one thing I do want to cover, if you plan on using your Dwarf 2 for a longer amount of time, 
something you might want to do is have it connected to a power supply and it just uses the normal USB-C to USB-C. If you use USB-C to USB-A, it might have a slower amount of charging speed and won't work correctly. Like it won't charge uh, as quickly as you would want it to, but if you use USB-C to USB-C, uh, it'll charge much faster. That's, that's another quick tip there. Um, but of course, once you're at your deep sky object, if it has bright stars like this, this is when the autofocus is most handy. So go to focus here and you can try the autofocus. Sometimes the autofocus works great and other times it's not exactly you know what you would want it to be. They also have the infinity button now. Um, I haven't tried that yet. I'm not really sure 100% about what that's for, but let's see if the autofocus works. All right, so it looks like it went back to the sharpest point uh, where the stars are gonna be the sharpest and the cleanest. So now all we have to do is wait for M42 to make its way over to the part of the sky where we're not gonna have any clouds. So uh, let's just allow it to do that. But again, in the meantime, another thing to discuss is filters. If you plan on using filters, uh, there's some things you have to remember. The ZWO Dua Band is definitely going to re uh, require much more time as it does cut out most of the light uh, other than the hydrogen alpha and the oxygen data. Um, so you will need a lot more exposure time with that. The Dwarf 2 UHC filter um, does work pretty well. Uh, you won't have to have as much exposure time with that one, but definitely whenever you're using filters, try to get as much exposure time as possible. Also, we have now in the Astro mode, we have the function, you go to the settings, and there's the, no, sorry. We go to the function, we go to the settings, yes. And they have the four by four and two by two binning, sorry, not four by four, the 4K and 2K. Now, if you definitely don't have a lot of storage space left on your laptop maybe, or a lot of storage space left on your Dwarf 2, you definitely wanna have it set on the uh, 2K. Uh, but if you do want the most detail in your night sky image, you're gonna wanna have the 4K also. If you have your astro mode set at 4K, you're gonna have to make sure you take uh, the dark frames for that 4K image. If you set it to 2K, you're gonna have to set it to 2K again. Otherwise, the dark frames will not be able to calibrate correctly with the light frames, and you'll just end up with an uh, image that has a whole lot of obnoxious noise in it, which you do not want for your astro image. Also, you can switch it to single or stacked images. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to use it for a stack if you're planning on using this for uh, the EAA, the electronically assisted astrophotography. And that's pretty much it. That's all you have to know. Of course, we could go to the settings here. Uh, just do a little explaining here. Gain, obviously you can bump that up as much as you want if you plan on having a lot more exposures than usual. Shutter speed, I would generally leave at about 15 with any kind of deep sky object. And the reason for that is because the longer your exposure times are, uh, the less time you're gonna have to be waiting uh, to see a better image. Um, of course, uh, the longer shutter speed could mean that a plane could go through or uh, some other object could get in the way, but at the same time, the longer your shutter speed, honestly, is the better. So, again, we're going to let the tree move out of the way, and once it's out of the way, we will begin the astrophotography process on M42. Alright, so as you can see, after a few minutes of waiting, uh, the tree is pretty much out of the field of view of the dwarf too. So now we go to the settings here. Again, the function. Uh, we bump up the shutter speed to 15, gain, I'm going to set at 100. Uh, you can also turn the infrared uh, light off or on. Uh, personally, I'm going to leave it as pass, uh, switch it back to function, and once that's done, we go to function again, we hit this button here, settings, have the count up here at 999, that's the max that the Dwarf 2 has at the moment, then you can choose between shooting with fits or tiff. Personally, I'm going to shoot with fits for stacking and zero later on. Uh, and once you're ready to begin your shooting, just go ahead and press the shoot button and it will begin to shoot and start stacking. Now, I'm just going to give it a minute uh, for you to see the first stacks uh, of the Dwarf 2, uh, just to give you a little example of what I personally think about the Dwarf 2 here. Now, the Dwarf 2, of course, was my first ever astronomical telescope. I got it back in May. Uh, I believe that's when it was. It's honestly the thing that got me introduced into astrophotography. And it absolutely blew me away. When I first saw it on the internet, I thought maybe it's just, you know, a scam uh, just because of the price. It was the first EAA telescope at that price point on the market. So uh, for me, that's something absolutely historical. I find that incredible. The Dwarf 2 has amazing optics. The calibration system is amazing. Uh, the focus, it's not 100% the best, I will admit. You know, I cannot give that 100%. It's great. Uh, because focus is not 
as good as I would like it to be. You know, with C Stars 50, the autofocus works perfectly every time. Perhaps Dwarf 2 just needs a little bit more uh, work on the algorithm with that, but I do think that it works great. Um, probably one of my favorite, most go-to telescopes out there. Uh, of course, until I get a big professional rig, even though, even once I have a bigger rig, I'll probably still be using my Dwarf 2. Uh, it's for its portability, uh, for other things, I definitely find Dwarf 2 uh, to be worth the price point that it's at. For sure, it's valued about $500. Uh, if you want to get the uh, the deluxe edition that comes with the solar filters, the UAC filter, the filter holder, um, I feel, I'm pretty sure it's about $500 as well. No, $550, somewhere along that price point, but I think it's a very, very much worth it. Uh, the UHC filter works great. Uh, the ND filters work great as well. It's very nice that the Dwarf 2 comes with that carry-on bag, uh, just like we have here. Uh, it's a very good quality uh, fabric bag. Uh, definitely haven't had any issues with it, no tears. It seems to be very sturdy uh, for the price that it comes with. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, I love the Dwarf 2 and I have no complaints about it. I also love the Dwarf Lab team, Grace, Sue, uh, Yin and Jay, Claire. Uh, those, uh, they, they, they're pretty much all, no, Fancy, Fancy too. They're all the people that I've met some, so far from the Dwarf Lab team and they're absolutely incredible. Their support team is amazing. Uh, and the thing that I really like about the Dwarf 2 is that the technology is continuing to advance. So um, if, if you were to say a request to the Dwarf Lab team, they would definitely do their best to implement that software request into their already made product and perhaps into the products that they have in the future, which is something I'm definitely looking forward to seeing uh, what Dwarf Lab has up their sleeve. But definitely the Dwarf 2 for what it is right now, I find it 100% uh, worth the price and I find it to be an amazing little tool. So we're gonna allow this to start stacking and once it's done stacking, uh, we will begin the post-processing uh, to see really what we can pull out with the Dwarf 2. You know, is it, is it a good tool for professional action photography for those who enjoy post-processing or should it just be used for EAA? Let's find that out in just a little bit. Okay, so you have brought your Dwarf 2 telescope inside, but how do you now transfer the images from your Dwarf 2 telescope to your laptop for post-processing? Well, first things first, you know, I want to make sure that you have your USB-C to USB-C connected from the base of your Dwarf 2 to your laptop for data transfer. Next, you're going to want to go to your Dwarf 2 app, make sure that you connect to your Dwarf 2, allow that to connect, it should only take a moment, hit join, and now that it is connected, you go to the settings here, you click on advanced settings, and you press on the MTP mode. Now that you have the MTP mode turned on, you should have access to the Dwarf 2 files. As you can see, we have the Dwarf 2 right here. You click on that, and here are the files. There we go. All right, so as you can see, we already have all of our M42 files imported from our Dwarf 2 uh, to the laptop. Of course, uh, one thing I would like to mention, you have to make sure you have a lot of storage space if you're going to do this processing on your PC, especially if you are using the 4K binning because it takes up a whole lot of your storage space. Um, for example, uh, you go to M42 and just look at the amount of space taken up by this folder. This one used up 13.5 uh, gigabytes and once it actually does the processing, it's probably going to run it up to about 100, maybe 150 gigabytes. And that didn't even get all the 999 uh, sub-exposures because my Dwarf 2 ran out of storage space. That's how much uh, pixels uh, and resolution is stored in these files from the Dwarf 2. So I'm really excited to see what we get with M42 to see if it's actually good for, uh, you know, prose processing astrophotography. Now here is the stacked image straight from the Dwarf 2. As you can see, it does look very nice. However, you can see these uh, airplanes that went through. Uh, there's not really a lot of saturation, of course, that could uh, be fixed a little bit in your native phone uh, photo editor. Uh, but we are going to run it through serial and do a run on Pixis site as well. Uh, to see what details we can pull out more uh, and see if this is really good for astrophotography. So let's get started with that. Uh, as you can see, I have Cyril open here already. Just go ahead and press the home button 
and let's set that as our home director uh, directory m42 open there uh, we want to make sure you have your OC pre-processing without dark spots or flats. If you don't have that installed and you're trying to follow this as a tutorial, please make sure you go and you check out the uh, serial setup guide uh, that I also have posted on my channel. It's one of my earlier videos, so you might hear some stuff. Uh, my speaking wasn't as fluent then. I, I wasn't really sure how to make videos at the time, so I probably will redo that video at some point, but... For now, just go back to that video. Again, that's the startup zero, uh, video for uh, installation of Cyril. Uh, also on your preferences here, let me move this out of the way. And the preferences. Uh, another thing that you want to make sure in regards to bearing is that you have bear information from Pilotus Header if available, checked. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is GBRG as the bear pattern, but if if not, I cannot quite remember it, but if it's not that, it will automatically convert, so you don't really have to worry about that if you have that box checked. Uh, but let's go ahead and allow this to run. Of course, it is, this is probably going to take a while because it is a lot of files and it's a lot of storage space that's going to be taken up. As you can see, uh, it's already going down quite significantly. Uh, so again, we're, we're just going to allow this to run, and once it's complete, we will continue with the post-processing on Pixinsight. site. Okay, so the stacking is finally complete after 10 minutes and 47 seconds of waiting. We are ready to get started. Now, something I always do after the stacking is complete, obviously I go ahead and exit out of the program. Uh, I always get rid of this process file because it has so much storage space that it takes up. Let me just show you. Uh, you go to the properties and as you can see, it takes up 176 gigabytes of your computer storage. Um, and it obviously takes much longer since it is using the 4K uh, resolution um, but you know it kind of just is what it is at a certain point so we go here uh, result that fit I'm just gonna drag this over to my pics inside program which is right here and let's go ahead and get started with the workflow for that program now I will say that in regards to taking the stars out of the picture I never use pics inside for that because using the pixel math to try to put that in um, is something I'm still learning if I'm being 100% honest and I'm not ready to show that to you uh, so in regards to taking the stars out, putting the stars back in, we will be using uh, Cyril for that. So make sure you still have Cyril ready uh, for that as well. Um, so we're just going to allow Pixinsight to go ahead and start up. And this is going to be my first uh, kind of tutorial using Pixinsight. Uh, all right, so I'm quite excited to get started uh, on this image. It's my first time doing a tutorial with Pixinsight. Uh, obviously, I'm going to drag my workspace over just to show you all the things that I usually use on my workflow with Pixinsight. Um, but first things first, uh, what we're going to do is go to our uh, Format Explorer, no, Process Explorer. Then we're going to use something called the Screen Transfer function, which you can uh, find if you go ahead and scroll down to here and click on All Processes, uh, Screen Transfer function. We're going to unlink our image and do a quick auto stretch here just so we can see more of what we're looking at. Now, generally, if you happen to have a lot of... Uh, artifacts around the edges. Uh, the next step would be the dynamic crop. Again, you can find that underneath of the process explorer. Uh, the dynamic crop is a little bit weird in my opinion, uh, differentiated with Cyril. Uh, instead of you doing a simple drag and drop type of thing, you kind of have to zoom out a little bit. And using these edges, you just kind of bring the sides in ever so slightly, you know, just enough so that it's kind of taking out those edge artifacts that you would have uh, from stacking uh, in the serial program. So just go ahead and do that. Once you're happy with your new size image, you go ahead and press this execute button and we can go ahead and zoom back in on this. Now, the next step is underneath, again, the process explorer is something called the dynamic background extraction. Now, Cyril does something similar to this, but I personally feel uh, like Pixinsight does it much better. Now, you can do the sample generation. Uh, you can just go ahead and press the generate button and it should collect these different sample points uh, to do a proper extraction. However, uh, I personally don't feel that it needs to do the sample generation. Just go ahead and click on these different points uh, on your image that don't have any kind of nebulosity um, or stars in it and you can use this little uh, box here to see what it is that you're clicking on uh, and once you are done choosing your little sample points here you go to your target image correction click on correction and do subtraction now you can leave all these things on or you can turn them off it's up to you 
Uh, it doesn't really change anything. It just lets you see uh, what it is that was extracted. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and press this check button here. And as you can see, it subtracted uh, a lot here. All this green, uh, that's what was subtracted. So we just go ahead and X out of that. And now we take a look at this one. There we go. We go back to our STF. And we link our image again in auto stretch. And it should no longer be uh, green like it was before. But as you can see, our background extraction was a little bit off. Uh, so what we can do is just go ahead and go back here. Oops. All right. We just go back here like so. Uh, do it again. And this time, you know, we are just going to go ahead and use a sample, a sample here. Uh, and we are going to click on this again, the subtraction, and let it run. There we go. And now let's try this one more time. Yes, here. Let's do our uh, auto stretch. And there we go. The sides are not as bad um, as they were previously. So honestly, it looks much better in my opinion. And you can see a lot of more of this nebulosity through here. But we have a lot of green here. Uh, that's another issue. We do still have quite a bit of green here in this image. How do we get rid of that? Well, again, you would go to your uh, Process Explorer. You would open up the background neutralization. Now for this, you have to make something called a preview. For the preview, click on this little button here. You zoom in to a part of your deep sky uh, image that does not have any stars or nebulosity in it. You just select it, it's a very small box. And you click here, you switch this to preview one. Hit okay. Afterwards, you just go ahead and click this. And it should automatically uh, do the extraction. So uh, once that background neutralization is done, you can go ahead and do your auto stretch again and hit the uh, X button here. Next, you go to your color calibration where you go to our background reference and do the uh, preview one here and hit OK. That way, again, we can let this just run on that. And as you can see, it completely got rid of all of the green here that we had in this image. And now the image looks much more beautiful. Uh, much more clean. Now, I'm just going to save this image, actually. Let's see, save prod, no, save as, and result dbe.fit, save. Uh, I'm going to save that, oops, not to that file. Let me close out of that, this PC. I'm going to save it to our desktop and save that there. Hit OK, save it as a 16-bit uh, uh, integer. Uh, hit OK here. And now we're going to bring this into Cyril. And using Cyril, we're going to take the stars out so that we can continue to work on this image. So let's hit the open button here. Go to our desktop, result.dbe.fit, hit open here. Uh, now we do our image processing, star processing, star and star removal, pre-stretch, and hit execute here. Now this again should only take a minute, so just go ahead and allow this to finish. All right, that is now complete. I'm just going to go ahead and minimize this. Uh, it should have both of the files here now somewhere, possibly in M42. Yes, starless result. Uh, I'm now going to open the starless result here in PixInsight. Let me just go ahead and move this to the side. There we go, PixInsight. And just, again, allow this to open. Now, here comes the part where we start to make our image look much more beautiful. Let me just close out of these ones. I no longer need them. Just go ahead and close out of this mask, close out of this preview, and now we can start working on some more things. Now, the next step uh, that we would do is our easy uh, auto stretch. So again, we go to script, we go to easy processing suite, and we do our easy soft stretch. Uh, now, you know, you don't have to play around with this too much. Just go ahead and uh, mess around with it. You know, just see what feels right uh, with this image um, based on this preview here. Uh, it allows you to kind of tell. You can use a zoom in button uh, in regards to nebulosity to see uh, what's being brought out, what's being left out. Um, and then later on, you can do a little bit of denoise uh, with easy denoise if you're not happy with how it looks. So just uh, kind of play around with these settings, the target, median, and the expand low until you're satisfied with how your image is looking. 
Uh, and don't forget, it's not going to end up looking like this because you still have to do your histogram transformation, uh, different uh, curves, stuff like that. So just once you're happy with how your image looks, <clears throat> just go ahead and press the run easy soft stretch button and it should finish just like that. Now, right after that, what you're going to do is go to your script, easy processing suite, and you're going to run your uh, easy denoise. Now, this is a part that takes forever. This, this is probably going to take you like 10, 20 minutes to complete. So again, if you want to take a break, feel free to take a break. All you have to do is just open it up and press the easy run denoise and allow it to finish. It's going to open a lot of different things, a lot of different layers that it's going to have to denoise, but it does an incredible job. So let's just allow this to finish and we'll come back to once it's complete. Okie dokie, so easy denoise is finally complete. It took a very long time to do. As you can see, it did have to uh, get rid of these different uh, layers of noise. Let's look at all that noise there that it got rid of. As you can see, the image here does look far cleaner than it did before. Uh, but now it's time to kind of get to work uh, in regards to the coloration of everything and the details of nebulosity and, you know, all that fun stuff. Uh, so next step that we do is our, uh, not that one, uh, it's the range mask. Now for this, this is very fun. Uh, you do the range selection, you open up a preview here, uh, you go ahead and bump up the, uh, lower limit until you kind of see the nebulosity here in the left corner, just making sure that you kind of stick with that. Cause you don't want to go beyond that. You, you don't want to saturate the background cause then it would just make the image look very ugly. You kind of bump up the fuzziness, bumped up the smooth smoothness by a good amount. Uh, again, you don't have to do uh, the fuzziness too much if you don't want to. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and lower down the lower limit just a little bit and bump up the fuzziness a bit more. There we go. And once you're happy with your selection, just go ahead and uh, once you're happy with your selection, you're going to press this little square here. It's gonna go ahead and make your range mask. You're gonna drag this, drop it onto this part, and that's gonna select all the nebulosity that you're gonna add that saturation into. Um, again, if you're not happy with it, you don't have to use that mask. You can try it again. Uh, go ahead and open this up. Or you can just, well, let me, yeah, there we go. Open that up and make sure I close out of that. And you can do it again, preview. Uh, kind of bump up the lower limit a bit more All right, or lower that down. Oh, there we go. And bump up the smoothness even more. Or you know what? Less. No, more. I don't know. Sort of just like a play it by your type of thing. You drag this up. Now drag that down. Bump up the smoothness some more. Uh, you can bump up the lower limit a tiny bit more. That should be good. I'm happy with that selection. Now you go ahead and push this little square here. You're gonna drag this over to the side, drag the range mask next to this tab here, and that's gonna set the mask there. Now everything that's selected within this mask, and do not close that out, just go ahead and minimize it. That's what's gonna be edited now. Uh, so here's the part where we change the saturation some. You go to your histogram transformation, sorry, not the histogram transformation, you go to your curves, transformation you click on the saturation here and this is where you can kind of bend this around uh, to get that saturation in there now sometimes this works sometimes it doesn't you have to go ahead and press a little preview button here uh, to kind of mess around with it as you can see you don't want to oversaturate your image either uh, you want to do it just enough so i'm going to bump that up i think that looks pretty good um, in my honest opinion just like that Bump it up some more. And you can even just bump it up on these little sides as well, uh, just to make it somewhat delicate. And once you're happy with it, go ahead and press the square, and that will have edited this image. And then you can close out of that. Very nice. Close your read time preview. Change your uh, range mask. Close out of that. Yes, done. And that is now saturated the way that you want it to be. Now, in the next part, you go to your uh, curves, no, your histogram transformation. You can kind of start messing with this uh, to change that nebulosity here. Again, you want to open up a preview window and start editing this. Obviously, you don't want to lower it down too much because you don't want your nebula to look unnatural. 
uh, but you go ahead and drag these around uh, the range just to keep the nebulosity in there, but also not uh, have your background too bright either. So go ahead and play around with this, and once you're happy, again, you press this little square here, and that will save it. Make sure you don't do it again. Close out of that, close out of that, close out of that, and here is your starless result image. I think this looks beautiful. I love this. Uh, I'm going to save this, uh, save as starless result, basically overriding that previous one. Hit yes, hit OK, 32-bit, uh, awesome, done. And now we can bring this back into Serial and add the stars back in here. Uh, so I'm not going to close this because just in case I would lose it, which is something I would do, knowing my luck. Uh, go ahead and open Serial up. We're going to press this uh, image processing here. Image processing, star recomposition, background stretch. This is our starless result. Hit open here. And we're going to do our star mask result. Open that. And let's bring our stars back into our image. Now you can kind of just play around with it. Uh, sometimes people like to go crazy with it. Sometimes they want less stars. Uh, and if you want less stars, you can bring up the black point on the stars somewhat. Personally, I think that makes them look somewhat ugly. Uh, so I'm just going to lower the stretch factor here. Kind of just keep it as low as possible. Hit apply here. Hit close. And this is our saved image. Now, uh, this does need to be rotated because that's not actually the way image uh, Orion's supposed to look. So we go to geometry. Uh, I believe it's vertical mirror. Nope. Um, you go to geometry again, uh, horizontal mirror. Yeah, it's a little bit closer. Let's do, do that one more time. Geometry and vertical mirror. And there we go. That's how our Orion image is supposed to look. Now, it does need to be cropped because we do have this weird black background here. Uh, so we could turn this into a portrait type image. Uh, so just go ahead and save it like this. Crop that. And here is our final image. Now we just go ahead and save this as a unique file. It has been saved as a PNG to as a working directory. Now it's time for the final verdict. Is this good for astrophotography? Now, notice my background here. This is Orion. This was taken by my Canon Rebel T7. Just a basic kit lens. Nothing, nothing that incredible. You can see the Running Man Nebula, Orion Heads Nebula, Horse Head Nebula. Is a dwarf too good in comparison to this, you know, for its price point? Let's find out. Tell me what you think. I think this image is incredible. I love this image. This is actually my first real image of Orion, and I'm extremely happy with it. Um, definitely, I would say that the Dwarf 2 is an incredible buy. It's an incredible product made by the Dwarf Lab team. Uh, $500 is really worth the price uh, given what they give you. Uh, the amount that you're able to do with it. At the beginning of the video, you saw other pictures that was that were taken by the Dwarf 2. Um, and here's another one that I'm going to have to add to the gallery because this is now one of my favorite pictures. I, I like it. It's very nice. Uh, but let me know what you guys think in the comments. I, I have always loved Dwarf 2. Uh, I had never done a review video on it before, so this is probably the first official review video that I've done. Uh, also, my first work through with Pix and Sight. Um, so I hope this was able to help you. This is, of course, extremely beginner stuff. I haven't really delved deep into the uh, harder stuff in Pix and Sight. This is very basic uh, need to know information in regards to Pix and Sight. Uh, but again, let me know what you guys think in the comments about Dwarf 2. Do you like Dwarf 2? Do you not like Dwarf 2? Would you consider buying a Dwarf 2? Um, if you do uh, consider it, please do it from the link that's in the comments because that's definitely going to help on my channel. It, it does have... Um, an affiliation link so i do get a slight percentage of the purchase they made from dwarf lab but that's not at an extra charge to you so it kind of helps both of us out definitely helps me to make more videos um and if you've been wondering why i haven't been making as many videos for the past couple months um some family members uh my dad in particular i love him uh he's a great man uh but he's going through some health issues and so uh, out of state for a little while and just been busy with very many other things but please know I have a whole lot of exciting other stuff to you know for you guys to look forward to uh, so please stay tuned for the channel uh, for the meantime um, anyways yes I really hope you guys liked the van, uh, video please leave a like and subscribe um, if you enjoyed it and if not just let me know in the comments why and everyone I wish you clear skies have a great night